David F. Bauer is professor of surgery and pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. He was previously director of pediatric neurosurgery at the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center until being recruited to Texas Children's Hospital in 2020, where he now has a focused practice in Chiari, complex Chiari, complex pediatric spine, and craniofacial surgery. He is chair of the guidelines committee of the Pediatric Neurological Surgery Section of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and Congress of Neurological Surgeons, and the lead author of the guidelines for the treatment of Chiari 1 malformation. He is also active in guidelines review and production for multiple organizations, including the American Academy of Neurology and American Academy of Pediatrics. We are also grateful to have Dr. Bauer as a member of the Scientific Education and Advisory Board for the Bobby Jones Chiari and Syringa Maelia Foundation. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Bauer to the podium. Oh, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. And uh, I'm so happy uh, to see everyone here. I really appreciate you coming and um, it, coming to hear me, me talk on uh, something that is uh, near and dear to my heart, which is um, Chiari malformation. And I um, uh, really think um, it's important for um, everyone to, uh, who's touched by, by Chiari to be on the same page um, and sort of understand things in the same way. Um, and so my hope today is that I can um, uh, uh, teach about uh, Chiari, um, talk about uh, maybe uh, what the future might hold for Chiari, and uh, let everyone know sort of a uh, sort of a um, uh, up to date um, uh, uh, talk on what should I know about Chiari malformation. So uh, we'll go through background and causation of Chiari malformation. Uh, the basic anatomy um, and the physiology behind Chiari. Um, so why, what is Chiari and, and um, uh, why do I have symptoms? Um, what is complex Chiari? So complex Chiari is a, a new term for a specific type of Chiari malformation and, and we'll go into that. Um, we'll talk about the usual treatment for Chiari and complex Chiari, um, the uh, guidelines and the Chiari databases, and really where do we go from here. And so I hope um, at the end of today we'll, um, we'll all have uh, an idea about uh, where it all started. And it really started um, at least the name for Chiari with this gentleman. Uh, he, uh, his name is Hans Chiari, and he uh, was a pathologist who worked in Vienna and Prague um, back in the 1800s. Uh, he, he was not a surgeon, um, and he didn't treat any patient with Chiari, uh, but he was a pathologist, and so he did autopsies on patients who uh, might, might have died for different reasons and found um, a series of 63 different cases of patients with Chiari. These are different types of Chiari, and so um, in the literature um, you may hear about Chiari 1, uh, two, three, four, and so he uh, first uh, wrote about these different types of Chiari, which all relate to some part of the back of the brain kind of coming lower than it should out of the skull. Um, there was another anatomist, uh, Julius Arnold, who described a similar finding in one autopsy, and so um, sometimes you'll hear um, Arnold Chiari malformation, um, and that's where that comes from. However, um, he only described one case, so most people just talk about Chiari malformation these days. Um, when I um, when I talk about Chiari, I, I um, uh, have a background in seeing many, many MRIs, and so I know um, what an MRI should look like, but um, for my families, um, often you haven't seen another MRI before, so you don't know um, what um, is, does it look like without Chiari. So this is a patient on the left, and you can see the um, uh, back of the skull over here, you can see the, uh, the nose over here, and uh, this is the cerebellum, 
and you can see that the cerebellum does not come down um, below the bottom of the skull, which is right there. And so this is a patient without Chiari. Um, and on the right, uh, this is a slice. This is called an, um, a cross-section or an axial slice of uh, an MRI, and it shows the uh, ventricles, the fluid-filled cavities in the brain. And so you can see there's, um, this is how it's supposed to look. There, there's no fluid building up um, or any abnormality. So this is a 16-year-old boy with a headache. Um, and this is a typical standard Chiari malformation. Um, the, uh, the key points, and you can see the, the back of the head over here, um, you can see the cerebellum, and you can see that it's not rounded, um, and that it, it's actually pointed and coming down and a little bit like a cork in a bottle. And so um, you can imagine that could block the flow of spinal fluid around the brain and potentially cause symptoms um, like headaches or elevated pressure in the head. Um, the other important thing to um, look at is um, the connection between the skull and the spine. And the, the connection here is a normal connection. You can see the spinal cord coming straight down without a kink. Um, we'll see other MRIs um, quite soon where um, there's a kink. And you can imagine that the kink could cause symptoms as well. And so that's uh, part of what complex Chiari is. Um, what's Chiari 2? Um, you might ask. So Chiari 2 is a condition that is only seen in patients with spina bifida um, or uh, myelomeningocele is the medical term. And um, in um, Chiari 2, the, the vermis, which is sort of a midline structure of the um, cerebellum is pulled down. So you can see that this looks different than the Chiari 1. And the uh, vermis is pulled down as well as the brain stem. And again, it's only in patients with spina bifida. Um, Chiari 3 and Chiari 4 are typically, they're, they're very different conditions, and so um, we won't talk about um, Chiari 3 and Chiari 4 today. Um, so what's um, associated with Chiari? Well, a condition called syringomyelia, or syrinx, or fluid in the spinal cord. And you can see um, in this patient, um, there's Chiari, and so you can see there's, there's uh, uh, part of the uh, cerebellum has, has gone down into the canal and caused a blockage of flow of spinal fluid. And then the spinal cord, which really should look like this, um, where it's uh, just a, a cord of this dark tissue, now has fluid in it down here. Um, and so here's another patient. Um, this is a, a little bit more severe. And so that's called syringomyelia, and it's often associated with Chiari because um, when you have a blockage of flow of fluid, the fluid can get pushed into the spinal cord and cause the, the syrinx, the fluid collection, um, and that can be harmful. Um, so what causes Chiari malformation? Um, why, why do some patients develop Chiari? And so uh, I'll... Um, uh, go into uh, some of the anatomic details um, and uh, for some patients it could be that the back of the skull is smaller than it should be um, and it's called a small posterior fossa. The posterior fossa is just this part of the skull, this back part. Um, on a cross section um, it's this part right here. And so you can imagine if the, um, the, the space is smaller than it should be, and if your cerebellum, the back of the brain, grows to a normal size, it may get pushed down and cause Chiari. And so that's um, one um, potential cause of Chiari. Um, another cause could be overgrowth of the cerebellum, where maybe the cerebellum, the back of the brain, grows uh, more than it should. Um, or you can imagine um, if you had a, a tumor or a mass in this location, it could push the brain down and cause Chiari. Um, if you had hydrocephalus or fluid in the brain, it could cause Chiari. Or um, another cause of Chiari is where um, the, um, uh, you have spinal fluid leaking from um, the low spine, and so it, it pulls the brain down. And uh, that's been um, seen, um, uh, it's rare to find, but uh, it can be a cause of Chiari. Um, Chiari 2, again, is congenital, um, and it's from leaking of spinal fluid from the back, where you have the spinal cord on the skin, that's called spina bifida. Um, and again, it pulls everything down. And um, there's a uh, technique of um, in utero surgery to treat 
um, spina bifida that we do at Texas Children's and that actually can um, almost cure the, the Chiari 2 malformation uh, because it prevents that leaking in utero. So it's, it's um, an, an, an amazing advancement. So what imaging is needed um, if I have Chiari? Um, I, I get this question a lot. Um, so um, the, the brain MRI is usually um, how we diagnose Chiari. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll see a patient with, a, with a, a cervical spine MRI, but usually it's a brain MRI. Um, and so um, it, that's important because I want to look for a brain tumor. I want to look for hydrocephalus or fluid in the brain causing a problem. Um, the spine MRI is important because you can imagine in uh, this patient down here, if you do a brain MRI and it stops right there, you may miss that there's a syrinx, a fluid collection in the spinal cord. And so uh, spinal MRI is, is critical. Um, and then some patients with Chiari have um, abnormal bones in the spine. And so if that happens, then I might get a, a CAT scan to better look at the bones to see if um, there's any abnormal movements between the bones. Um, and I may also get something called dynamic imaging. Um, and this is um, a flexion and extension MRI where you, you have your head go forward and backwards to look for abnormal movement. Um, this is usually just in patients with the complex Chiari. Um, what symptoms might improve with surgery and what causes these symptoms? So um, to me this is um, very important because not everyone with Chiari um, needs surgery, only patients with symptoms. And so um, the symptoms from Chiari can be headaches. Um, typically the most common uh, description is a headache in the back of the head um, with activity, um, with coughing, uh, maybe with sports. Uh, maybe if you're having a bowel movement or you're bearing down, um, these different types of activities, jumping on trampoline, um, could cause headaches. I've had patients who every time uh, they laugh, they have headaches. Um, and so um, uh, the, uh, the, the type of headache is important um, because patients can have headaches from different reasons. You can have a migraine headache. Um, that may be a little different. You can have a, um, a sinus headache. You could have um, tension headaches. There are different types. And so when I um, hear a patient has headaches, I try to find out um, where they are, um, what causes the headaches, to see if I think they're related to Chiari. Um, another symptom that uh, patients can get are brainstem symptoms. And so on this MRI, you can see that um, the brainstem is coming straight down and there's no kinking. Um, on this MRI, you can see that there's a little bit of a kinking and compression of the brainstem where the pointer is located. Um, also, there's the fluid, the syrinx. And so some patients that come in with Chiari who have these findings um, might have abnormal eye movements where their eyes have jerky um, or they don't uh, line up. Um, I've had patients who have problems swallowing, um, can't swallow meat or, or solid foods. Uh, patients who have uh, sleep apnea where they stop breathing at night and uh, their oxygen level goes down. And that's all from injury to the bottom of the brain called the brain stem that, that causes all these functions. Um, those symptoms are more rare, but, but can happen. Um, and then the syrinx is a symptom, the, the fluid collection in the spinal cord. Um, kids with Chiari 2 um, often have slightly different symptoms. They're usually the brainstem symptoms, swallowing, problems breathing, um, but can also have neck pain in the syrinx. Um, so who might benefit from surgery for Chiari? Um, so patients with symptoms will benefit from surgery. Um, so that, that's a truism. If you're having symptoms and we um, know they're related to Chiari, then surgery is, is an indicated and important. Um, but patients without symptoms do not need surgery. So there is no need to prophylactically do surgery um, to prevent symptoms from happening in, in the future um, because it's uncommon that they would develop. Um, determining what symptoms are related to Chiari can be challenging. Um, you can imagine if you can have headaches that are caused by different things, um, you need to make sure those headaches are from Chiari before a child undergoes surgery. 
Um, so I often will um, do a headache diary. I'll have uh, patients maybe see a headache neurologist trying to make sure that um, I'm doing the right thing if we go to surgery. Um, Symptoms unrelated to Chiari will not get better with surgery. Again, this is also a, a truism. Um, if the um, headaches are from a sinus infection, we could do the Chiari surgery and you're still going to have headaches. And so um, it's important to, to make that differentiation. And again, um, um, there's no need for prophylactic surgery. Um, and uh, we have some data on that. So um, asymptomatic patients. Um, we're in this natural history study that I was part of at Dartmouth, um, and these patients were diagnosed incidentally um, with Chiari malformation, often after a concussion or some sort of accident. Um, they had no abnormal joints between the skull and the spine and um, no fluid in the brain or fluid in the spinal cord. Um, at Dartmouth, we had 52 patients that we followed prospectively. So we um, enrolled the patients in a trial and then um, saw them every year, got an MRI every year for at least eight years. And only 5% of those patients ever developed symptoms that required surgery. Um, it, another uh, cohort um, in Alabama was followed for two years, uh, but it was a larger cohort, and only 3% of those patients required surgery. And so, um, to me, this is good data that if you um, are seen by a neurosurgeon and do not have symptoms, then it's a uh, very low chance that you would develop symptoms in the future and need surgery. Is it safe to play sports um, with Chiari? Um, we have some data on this. Um, in the literature, there are 21 case reports of patients with Chiari um, deteriorating or having problems following a trauma with four cases of sudden death. That's scary. Um, but um, when you think about how many people have Chiari, if it's one in 500 people, um, that that probably means that these are such bad traumas that the, these patients would probably um, have a bad outcome whether they had Chiari or not. And so the question is, is it related to Chiari? And so there's a study of over 700 pediatric patients and uh, we found that there was no increase in injury or concussion in asymptomatic patients with Chiari. So I think it's probably safe to play sports if you have Chiari malformation. Um, when I was at a, a national meeting, I uh, did a poll of uh, the pediatric neurosurgeons at the meeting and asked them if they had a patient with Chiari who had surgery and now they had no symptoms, um, would they let the patient play contact sports like tackle football? Half of the neurosurgeons said yes and half of the neurosurgeons said no. Um, but I don't know of any um, incidents where a patient has been allowed to play tackle football and then had a, an injury because of the surgery or the Chiari. So I, I think it's probably safe to play contact sports after a successful surgery. Um, however, um, I think as a parent it's, it's important to be able to make that decision for yourself. And so sort of know the data on it and, 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 and make your own personal decision. Um, What's the data on, um, on, on Chiari as far as uh, complications from surgery? Um, I trained with um, Dr. Oakes, who is one of the fathers of Chiari surgery. Um, he worked in, um, at Children's of Alabama. And he wrote up a case series of 500 cases uh, between 1989 and 2010. Um, he, um, of those patients, 40% of these patients presented with headache and uh, around 20% presented with scoliosis. Um, his average hospital stay was three days and uh, uh, most patients returned to school within two weeks um, and he had a 2.4% complication rate with uh, his surgery. Um, four patients needed um, fusion between the skull and the spine. Uh, four patients needed a shunt, um, and uh, one patient developed meningitis. Overall, that seems pretty safe. Um, there's a um, more contemporary series um, in uh, Park Reef, uh, some, uh, Research Consortium. I was part of this. Um, so were over 30 other centers. 
And uh, this was a um, prospective um, analysis of the data, meaning that um, someone was asking these questions as patients recovered from surgery. Um, are you having a problem? You're more likely to catch something if you prospectively ask questions than if you retrospectively look back at your charts. And so this may be better data. Um, almost 700 patients. Um, the PFD means posterior fossa decompression. It means just bone removal. And the PFDD means the bone removal with sewing in a patch. And um, you can see that the complication rate was between 13 and 24 um, percent. Around uh, 20 percent, 8 to 20 percent of patients needed a second surgery. Um, some patients had a fluid collection um, that might have needed surgery to treat after surgery. Um, some patients had a spinal fluid leak or meningitis. Uh, some patients required a shunt. And, um, uh, but a very small number of patients required a fusion of the spine. And to me, this is important as a family if you're um, going to um, have your child undergo um, Chiari surgery, it's important to know these risks and so that you can understand what might be in store in the future. Um, so how is Chiari surgery um, performed? So we've, um, we've been through a lot of uh, the um, uh, sort of the, the background on why Chiari causes symptoms. If um, your child does have um, surgery, um, there are a few different steps. Um, that are standard of care. Now, one is um, general anesthesia, so you're, you're, you're under anesthesia, you're asleep. Um, we uh, make an incision, um, and you can kind of see uh, where the incision might be. Um, and we'll open the skin and we have to move the muscles to the side. Um, then we have to remove some of the skull, and then we need to remove um, some of the um, lamina, the roof of the first cervical vertebrae, to give additional space. Um, Often we will open the dura, the covering around the uh, brain and spinal cord, and we'll uh, make sure that the spinal fluid is flowing freely. Um, and then we'll um, sometimes um, either cauterize or remove part of the cerebellar tonsil that's causing the blockage of flow of fluid. Um, and then we'll sew in a patch to basically give additional room. Um, and then we'll close the muscle in the skin. Um, so all of these are to achieve the goal of the surgery, which is to give additional space um, around the back of the brain so the spinal fluid can flow freely and not build up pressure and cause symptoms. Um, I have a couple pictures uh, from an operation. Would uh, you like to see those pictures? Okay, so um, I'll, um, I'll show you this one and I'll, I'll describe it. So this is a, a picture where um, this is the skull, and uh, over here on the right, uh, this is um, down the cervical spine. Um, here is where the bone is removed. You can see the area where the bone is removed. And uh, this is the uh, first cervical vertebrae, so this is where the roof of the spinal cord was, uh, um, was, was uh, or the uh, spinal canal was opened. And so really, this is the area where the compression is, where the cerebellar tonsils have come down. And so. Um, this is sort of a standard way of, of, of removing the bone. And then uh, this is uh, opening the, uh, the dura, the covering around the brain. And you can see the cerebellar tonsil down here. And then we sew in a patch. And so we basically just give space for the cerebellar tonsils. And so um, what is complex Chiari? And is it important? So we, we talked about complex Chiari. And, um, it is Chiari plus additional anatomic problems. Um, the skull could be settling um, down on the spine. Um, the spine could have abnormal uh, looseness in the joints. Um, the skull could be poorly attached to the spine. Um, or the spine could be pushing on the spinal cord and causing symptoms. So there are a few ways to uh, look at this and measure this. And uh, one is called a PBC2. And it's looking at compression here. Um, another is uh, the CXA. And you can see the, uh, if, with the CXA is more acute than the, the brain stem here can be kinked. Um, there's a, a different uh, classification that's looking at sort of the alignment of the skull and the spine. and. Uh, 
you can imagine that if you have a, a spine like this where the bone is pushing up into the spinal canal that you can really cause compression of the brainstem and symptoms. Again, this is not common but can happen. Um, and sometimes uh, some patients require a removal of the bone either through the nose um, like this or through the mouth like this um, to basically give additional room from the front. Um, again, this is a very uncommon surgery, um, but um, one that, that we perform at our hospital, but um, is not performed at many hospitals. So is every Chiari malformation the same? So to me, this is the, um, the, important, the most important part of this talk. And it's uh, so that everyone understands that um, the reason why not everyone has symptoms from Chiari is that um, not every Chiari malformation looks the same. And so this is, uh, again, the patient, um, maybe a 15-year-old patient with uh, standard Chiari malformation. This is different. And so this is a one-year-old boy, um, came in with motor delay. Um, can you see the uh, cerebellar tonsils? They're coming all the way down um, half of the cervical spine. So they're, they're, they've, they've, they're, they're much longer than the last patient. And then over here you can see that there's kinking of the brainstem. You can see that the brainstem is not uh, going straight down, it's being compressed. Um, so this is a very, very different Chiari malformation, but this patient was still diagnosed with Chiari malformation. Uh, this is a, um, another patient, a one-year-old girl um, who came in with poor feeding. Um, you can see um, this patient also has Chiari malformation, um, but a fluid on the brain called hydrocephalus. Um, which needs to be treated. Um, so again, has Chiari malformation, but, but very different. Um, here is a, uh, another patient, a seven-year-old boy um, with a, a C2, C3 fusion. Um, the term for that is called clipophile. You can see here the uh, second and third vertebrae are fused together. And this patient has headaches with sports. And so this patient, um, also with Chiari malformation, um, likely needs uh, removal of the bone, but may need a fusion of the spine um, between the skull and the spine because of this spinal abnormality. Um, and this is a, um, also a very different patient, a 16-year-old um, girl with headaches. Um, you can see here that the um, um, skull um, really has this um, sort of an acute 90-degree angle. And look over here at the brainstem. So um, if you remember, other patients need their Chiari treated from the back. Um, this girl needs her Chiari treated from the front, and so we needed to remove the um, uh, bone that's compressing the brainstem um, by going through the nose to drill it out. So um, again, this is not common, but uh, these all have Chiari malformation, they're just treated differently. Um, there are some other um, Chiari related, um, potentially Chiari related diagnoses. Um, some patients have come to me with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, a condition where you have uh, very loose joints and some of these patients may have looseness between the skull and the spine and need a spine fusion. Um, some patients have clipophile, which is uh, that congenital fusion of some of the vertebrae. Um, and again, I always look for that in my patients. Um, some patients have basilar invagination, that's where the skull sinks down on the spine, um, or tethered spinal cord, where the uh, end of the spinal cord is tethered to the sacrum, to the tailbone, and they, may not, uh, they might need that treated. Um, and some patients have come to me with um, a condition called um, dysautonomia, or POTS, which is um, a uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, and so uh, these patients may benefit from additional therapies from experts that uh, are um, um, expert in treating these conditions. And so I, I will um, evaluate for these problems in all of my patients. So we're, we're getting to the part of the talk um, where we think about what's next and uh, what I think um, can help patients in the future. Um, one is the Park Reeves Research Consortium. Um, so the, again, this is a group of over 30 hospitals um, that has studied Chiari um, in great detail. Um, we've published many um, uh, papers in the medical literature um, and we're trying to study, uh, based on this large patient database, 
um, different specific parts of Chiari so we can better inform and take care of patients. Um, there is a Chiari, um, Chicago Chiari Outcome Scale um, that was developed um, at University of Chicago by a neurosurgeon named Dr. Frim. And this was so that um, when we study Chiari and I'm talking about my patients and you're talking about your patients, that we have a common language to describe how well our patients are doing. And so I can say, well, my patients, uh, their headaches are gone, um, but um, is that really a, a meaningful way of um, determining if my patients are doing as well as, as your patients? And so um, the um, uh, Chiari Outcome Scale lets us ev better evaluate how well our patients are doing after surgery so that we can um, better um, look at how they're doing to see if maybe a, a different technique is helpful in the treatment of Chiari. And the Chiari Surgical Success Scale is a uh, scale that we are currently trying to develop. Um, Dr. Brockmeyer, um, a friend of mine who is at Utah, has headed this uh, with the Chiari and Stringo Maioli Association, um, Bobby Jones. Um, this is a, a um, potential scale where you could take a questionnaire and uh, based on the uh, findings on the questionnaire determine whether surgery would be helpful or not. Um, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons or the CNS um, uh, sponsored guidelines that I helped to produce. Um, they just got published a few months ago. Um, this was a process where I had um, 15 neurosurgeons plus uh, um, Dorothy and Mary uh, to uh, help to give uh, sort of the, the patient's voice um, to the project. And we looked at um, different um, parts of Chiari and we looked at all of the medical literature to see if we could um, find the truth, you know, the, the, the truth about um, different aspects of Chiari surgery. And then Bobby Jones uh, CSF also has a patient database. And so just in brief, the um, Chiari guidelines, um, we had three main questions. They're online and so you can read them yourself if you'd, li if you'd like to. They're um, free on the Congress of Neurological Surgeons website. Um, the first chapter uh, was on the diagnosis of Chiari malformation um, and, and what's the best way to diagnose it, what studies do you need. Um, the second uh, chapter was on the treatment of Chiari malformation. Um, what symptoms are most likely to improve? Um, should you do prophylactic surgery? Um, should I get my family screened? Is this a genetic condition? Um, the third chapter was on additional questions um, such as how to do the surgery. Um, when will um, a syrinx improve? And do I need long-term follow-up? So if I am doing well two years after surgery, do I still need an MRI every year for life? Or am I good for life? Um, so, uh, just in closing, um, I'll, I'll show a couple examples uh, from, from patients that I've, I've taken care of. And so, this is a patient with um, Chiari, uh, syrinx, headaches, um, scoliosis. Um, you can see um, compression um, here from the Chiari malformation, the cerebellar tonsils coming down. You can see the fluid collection in the spinal cord. And um, I removed the bone called the decompression and I did a duroplasty sewn in the patch and you can see um, the fluid collection around the back of the brain um, and the, the uh, syrinx, the fluid has um, uh, left the spinal cord. So this is a successful surgery and the, the symptoms went away. Uh, this is a, um, another patient, um, a six-year-old patient who had abnormal eye movements, abnormal reflexes, um, weakness um, in the arms and legs and incontinence. And you can see um, this is um, very different. This is very severe compression uh, from in front and in back of the um, spinal cord. You can see some fluid that's uh, sort of uh, welling up in the spinal cord right there. And uh, after decompression and removal of one of the tonsils, the cerebellar tonsils with the duroplasty, symptoms completely resolved and you can see the compression's gone. And so um, I, I hope uh, everyone's enjoyed uh, this talk. I hope it's been um, educational and, and maybe helpful to better understand um, the types of Chiari and um, what might happen if you, if you do have Chiari. Um, We've gone over complex Chiari and the guidelines and the database. And um, 
I just wanted to say thank you. This is my team, so I, I feel very fortunate to be at Texas Children's and have um, one of the largest teams of pediatric neurosurgeons in the world. Um, uh, that allows me to specialize in, in uh, taking care of patients with very specific problems. And uh, I also wanted to thank um, Dorothy and Mary and uh, Caitlin's in the center um, with uh, Bobby Jones CSF for sponsoring this. And um, uh, I uh, look forward to more of these meetings. And I'd love to answer any questions if, if you had any questions um, now or, or in the future. Um, thank you so much.